There are infinite numbers between 0 and 1. There's 0 0.1, 0 0.12, 0 0.112, and an infinite collection of others. Of course, there's a bigger infinite set of numbers between 0 and 2, or between 0 and a million. Some infinities are bigger than other infinities. This is a line from John Green's book titled The Fault in Our Stars, and it presents an incorrect understanding of the phrase, some infinities are bigger than others. While the statement in itself is true, its application is not. There are just as many numbers between 0 and 1 as there are between 0 and 1. And two. So if that's not what it means, what infinities are bigger? Well, when we consider the size of a set, we generally talk about its cardinality, which is roughly the number of individual objects in it. For example, this box contains five ping pong balls. I can count one, two, three, four, and five. But when we have a set of infinite size, we can't just count the number of elements in it because there are infinitely many. So how do we go about size in this matter? Well, we have to bring in the idea of a bijective function. A function from a set A to B maps every element from A to to exactly one element in B. For example, this is a function, this is a function, and this is a function. We now say that a function is injective if each element in A maps to a distinct element in B. For example, these are injective functions, but this one isn't, because these two elements map to the same element in B. Now we call a function surjective if every element in B is mapped to by at least one element in A. For example, these are surjective functions, but this one isn't, because this element in B is not mapped to by anything in A. Now finally, a bijective function is a function that is both injective and surjective, meaning every element in A maps to a distinct element in B, and each element in B is mapped to by something in A. This creates a pairing between elements so that no elements are left unpaired. From this we can say that if there exists a bijection between two sets, they must have the same cardinality. So since we know set A has five elements, set B must also have five elements. Now the final object we need is an infinite cardinality. Let's first consider the natural numbers or the counting numbers. If we try to assign this set a finite cardinality, we could always just add one. A Google is a natural number, Graham's number is a natural number, tree three, tree four, tree Google. We can always just find something larger. So we have to introduce the first transfinite cardinal number, Aleph null. This is defined by the cardinality of the natural numbers and doesn't follow the same rules as finite ones. If I were to add in another element to a set with cardinality five, my set now has a cardinality of six. But what if I were to add another element to the natural numbers, say zero. Well, what I can do is just add one to each element and we get the natural numbers. And it turns out this method is very well defined, and it goes back to the idea of a bijection. Take the set of natural numbers and the set of natural numbers including zero. We consider the function f of x equals x plus one. Zero goes to one, one goes to two, 2 goes to 3, and it continues infinitely. Hang on, every element in B is being mapped to by a distinct element in the natural numbers, specifically itself plus 1. And every number in the natural numbers is being mapped to by at least one element in B. And these are our two conditions for a bijection, so these two sets must have the same size. But it's not just adding one element, we can take half of them away. Consider the positive even numbers. We simply define the function f of x equals 2x, and that's a bijection. We can do the same for odd numbers numbers, multiples of tens, squares, and even rational numbers. The point is, when dealing with any level of infinity, adding any finite amount will still leave us with infinity. And we have a special name for these sets, calling them countably infinite, as they relate to the counting numbers. So if these sets all have the same size, what does this phrase actually mean? Well, it turns out there are infinitely many more real numbers than there are natural numbers. But why? Well, let's have a look at the real numbers. This includes all of the integers, rational numbers, and irrational numbers like pi. If you can find it on the number line, it's real. Now to start, let's focus on the interval 0 to 1. The question I have now is what comes after 0? Well, some of you would say infinitely many zeros, then a 1. But that doesn't make sense. If we have infinitely many zeros, we can't terminate it with a 1. There is no next number. Now at this point you're probably thinking, hang on, there's also no next rational number. How come that's a countable infinity? Well, there's a meaningful way to order these numbers by the sum of their numerator and denominator. This allows for a bijection with the naturals, making it countable. But for the real numbers, there is none, and that leads us into a proof. In 1891, Georg Cantor published his famous diagonal argument, which starts with the assumption that you can number 
number all of the real numbers. Since there's no way to go from one to the next, we can just randomly list them out. But is this list complete? Well, let's consider the nth digit of each nth number. For example, the first digit of the first number, second of the second, and so on. Now take this newly formed number and add one to each of its digits. Is this new number on the list? Well, I know it's not the first number because they have different first digits. I know it's not the second number because they have different second digits. I know it's not the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth. This number is not on the list. Okay, let's just add it to the end of the list because infinity plus one is infinity. But hang on, I can just do this again and again and again. No matter how many times we do this, there'll always be a number which is not on the list. Now for most of you, this is a satisfactory proof that there are more real numbers than natural numbers, but I know some of you would like to see a proper proof by contradiction. So let me break it down. We first note that there exists a bijection between the interval 0, 1 and the real numbers. There are many explicit functions we can use, but all we need is one. Now we assume that the cardinality of this interval is the same as the natural numbers. We'll aim to prove this wrong by the end. If this is the case, then there must exist some bijection f from the natural numbers to the real interval 0, 1, which would take the form of this sum. This is just some decimal expansion which lies between 0 and 1. We now define some a such that a n is always different from d n n. This means that the nth digit of a will always be different from the nth digit of f of n. This means that for all natural numbers n, fn does not equal a, and hence a is not in the image of f, meaning f is not surjective. Thus we have a contradiction, and hence these two sets do not have the same cardinality. So now we can definitively say the cardinality of the real numbers is strictly larger than the cardinality of the natural numbers, but if I say any more, I could spark a bit of drama. You see, when Cantor proved this statement, he also proposed that the cardinality of the real numbers is aleph 1. That would mean that the cardinality of the real numbers is strictly larger than the cardinality of the natural numbers and there were no cardinalities in between. This would come to be known as the continuum hypothesis as it relates to the real numbers or the continuum. But there's only one problem. We can't prove that it's true and we can't prove that it's false. What? In order to prove a mathematical theorem, we start with a set of axioms and make a series of logical arguments which lead us to a conclusion. These axioms are statements so obvious they don't need proof to be accepted. For set theory, we have the zamello frankel set theory with the axiom of choice, or ZFC. So for decades, mathematicians worked tirelessly to try and prove or disprove the continuum hypothesis to no avail. But that was until Kurt Gödel came along. In 1940, Kurt Gödel, yes the incompleteness theorem guy, proved that you can't disprove the continuum hypothesis. Or in other words, assuming ZFC doesn't contradict itself, there's no contradiction in saying the cardinality of the real numbers is exactly LF1. But he still hadn't proved that they're equal yet, and that's when we introduced Paul Cohen. In 1963, using a technique called forcing, Cohen proved that you cannot prove the continuum hypothesis either. So using the ZFC axioms, we can neither prove or disprove the continuum hypothesis. This means that all we can definitively say is that the cardinality of the real numbers is strictly larger than aleph null and nothing more. So now we have two infinities, one being infinitely larger than the other. Can we keep going? Well, yes. In fact, we can prove that there are infinitely many infinities. In the same paper as the diagonal argument, Cantor proved that there was a smallest transfinite cardinal number being aleph null. And for every cardinal number, there exists some next larger cardinal number. This means that there must exist infinitely many infinities. But how did we even get here? Well, it all comes down to power sets. The power set of a set A is the set of all possible permutations of elements in A. For example, the power the power set of 1, 2, 3 contains the empty set, the set containing 1, the set containing 2, and so on. There are exactly 2 to the n elements in this set, which is clearly more than A has. But what Cantor found is that this also applies to infinite sets. We consider any function f from A to the power set of A and assume that it is bijective. We now define a special subset of A to be the Cantor diagonal set. This is the set that contains all elements of A, which do not map to a subset of A that they're contained in. Now, since f is a bijection and d is a subset of a, there must exist some element x in a such that f of x equals d. This leaves us with two possibilities. If x is in d, then by definition of d, x is not in f of x, but f of x is d. 
D. This contradicts the assumption that X is in D. And if X is not in D, then by the definition of D, X is in F of X, which is equal to D. This also contradicts the assumption that X is not in D. So in either case, we hit a contradiction, which means our assumption must be wrong and F cannot be bijective. What this means is that the cardinality of the power set of the natural numbers is strictly larger than the cardinality of the natural numbers. In fact, this cardinality is exactly the same as the cardinality of the real numbers. But it doesn't end there. We can also take the power set of the power set, and the power set of that power set, and the power set of that power set. And every time we take the power set, our cardinality will be bigger than before. So from this result, we get that there exist infinitely many infinities. The lazy H symbol was first used by John Wallace in 1655 to represent infinity, a single endless unified concept. But Cantor showed us something different. The quote at the start of this video was a deliberate choice by John Green, a character misquoting a concept she only partially understands. The line resonates because it sounds poetic, but as we've seen, it's also mathematically true. There are infinitely many infinities and we'll never be able to write them down, but what we can do is prove that they're there. 